Well, hello. You have found your way back to fill in the blanks. This obviously is Dr. Phil filling in the blanks. Last episode, we started a series talking about toxic personalities that you encounter in your life, and I introduced you to the narcissistic personality disorder, particularly, and narcissism in general. Now, let me tell you what I'm going to do today. And as I said, I want this to be a conversation, and I'm going to invite you to do two things. If you haven't subscribed to fill in the blanks, do so now. You can hit the subscribe button, and it will give you alerts whenever we drop an episode so you don't miss anything. I really want this to be more of a conversation, like you and I were sitting around talking about this, and I'm going to ask you to submit any questions, because for the next episode, I'm going to specifically answer your questions or respond to your comments. Now, I'm going to be talking about different personality disorders, and I've started out by talking about the narcissistic personality disorder. I'm going to do a deep dive this time on a subset or a certain type of narcissism, the covert narcissist. And I'm going to do a bit of a review of what we talked about last time just real quickly to bring this back current in your head. Now, first off, let me say that there's a difference between being a narcissist and having a narcissistic personality disorder. A narcissistic personality disorder is a specific diagnosis that you find in the DSM-5. And that means that you have to fit into certain criteria. Says you have to have it for so long, you have to check certain boxes, et cetera. A lot of people might not meet all the criteria for that diagnosis, but that doesn't mean that they aren't narcissists. I think all human behavior is on a continuum, and then subsets of human behavior are on a continuum. Narcissism is on a continuum. It ranges from maybe being a little narcissistic to being woefully narcissistic. It's not like being a little bit pregnant. It's not like you either are or you aren't. So what I'm talking about today is narcissism, not necessarily the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder, and you don't care. If you're dealing with a narcissist in your life, you don't care whether they check all the boxes for the diagnosis or not. You care how they impact your life. Now, When you think of narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder, you think about the classic definition of a narcissist. And that's what we talked most about last time. And what are they? Well, narcissists are very grandiose. They have to be the center of attention. They have an exaggerated need for admiration, right? They just need everybody to think that they're special. They're very superficial They're exploitive in relationships. Now, why do I say that? And I don't want to just read a list off to you. I want to talk about it so it means something to you. When I say these people are grandiose, they just think they are something special. Better than you. Above you. They come across that way. And they have this insatiable need for admiration. They've got to be the center of attention. Everybody has to think they're special. They need for you to admire them and hold them up on a pedestal. And because they have to be the focus of attention and admiration at all times, then their relationships are superficial because in order for a relationship to be healthy, it has to be give and take. One way to control a relationship is to be constantly the giver, constantly the power figure. It takes vulnerability to receive. It takes vulnerability to say you need something from someone. And a narcissist doesn't need anything from anybody because they're godlike. They are a power figure. So they have this superficial, exploitive string of relationships where they never get really close to anybody. And one thing they do not have is empathy. 
Now, that means they don't have the ability to stand in your shoes and experience what you might be experiencing, which is okay for them because they don't care. They can give a damn less about what your experiences are because that's not about them. And they're only interested in those things that are all about them. They have what we call an identity disturbance. These people are not really sure who they are. They're always playing a role. They're always thumping their chest. They're always pretending to be something they're not. And so they have a difficult time forming attachments and forming bonds. And as a result, there's a chronic emptiness with these people. They're never fulfilled and they're easily bored because nothing ever really fulfills them. They're very vulnerable to life transitions when things change and they have to adapt. They don't do very well at that. And I'm going to give you some reasons why. Look, generally speaking, these people have real feelings of inferiority. So what you're seeing when you're dealing with a narcissist in general is a false sense of superiority. You know, somebody that's really powerful, somebody that's really smart, somebody that's really skilled, really good at something, they don't need to tell you all the time how smart and good they are. They're very confident in that. They're very at peace about that, so they just do it. They let their actions speak for them. They don't need you to be clapping for them all the time. They don't need you to stand up when they enter the room. They don't need you to look at them all moo-eyed all the time because they don't need you to tell them who they are. But narcissists don't really know who they are. Everything is an act with them. They're empty, superficial, and shallow. So they've given their power away to other people. And that's why there are certain things you can't do with them because if you do, if you challenge them in any way, they get very, very, very uncomfortable with that. And as a result, they will rage. They will create all kinds of problems for you if you do anything that tends to challenge them in any way whatsoever. So it's not something that you ever want to do with a narcissist, and we'll talk about that in just a second. How often are you going to encounter a narcissist? Well, you know, generally in the population at large, you're talking maybe 10 or 15 percent of the people are going to qualify as narcissists or narcissistic personality disorder, but it depends on what population you interact with. Because there are some populations where narcissists are much more frequently encountered. For example, as I said last week, CEOs. You find narcissists much more frequent among bosses than you do among the general population. You find narcissists a lot more frequent in the entertainment industry, in television, in leadership positions, there you sometimes see the frequency as high as 50%, like three times as high as the general population. Now, why is that? Well, the fact of the matter is we tend to reward a lot of things that narcissists do. You know, they're bold and they're brash and they're charming and they're charismatic. It's superficial, but in the moment, it sometimes gets rewarded versus the shrinking violet. So we reward bad behavior sometimes in industry and in the entertainment industry. So you find these people frequent leadership positions, front of the room positions, more than they do other occupations. And I mean, think about it. A narcissist wants to be the center of the attention all the time. So let's say you put them on television, give them their own show. Now that doesn't mean everybody with their own show is a narcissist. So I hear you laughing as I'm saying that. 
But as I said, it's on a continuum. I probably have some of the characteristics and qualities that would be defined as narcissistic, but hopefully there are a lot of other things about my personality that would disqualify me, such as actually having empathy and caring about other people. I can clearly form attachments, and then I've been married for 45 years, so you can't just look at any one thing. But the fact is, we do tend to reward those behaviors, and sometimes those that are the most outspoken and gravitate towards the front of the room get rewarded for it. Sometimes they should, sometimes they shouldn't. Just because you yell and scream for attention doesn't mean you're worthy of it. I'll just put it that way. But who are these people? And why are narcissists narcissists? Well, there's a lot that's not known about that, but we do know that narcissists as a group have been through a lot of trauma as children, oftentimes, not all of them, but some of them. They come from extreme parenting. Either they were neglected as children, so they feel like they have to fight for attention, or maybe they had too much attention as children. They were spoiled. Their parents made them think that they were special, that they were entitled, that they should be the center of attention all the time, and so that transferred into adulthood. So the extremes of parenting, both extremes, extreme neglect or extreme attention, entitlement, and spoiling can make someone react in adulthood the way a narcissist behaves. They are insecure. And so what I talked about last week is you need to set up boundaries, you need to protect yourself, and don't bother to try to fix these people because it's way above your pay grade. And they're often way above my pay grade, just to be honest with you. Now, there's more than one type. There's the classic narcissist we've been talking about. There are malignant narcissists. These are people that weaponize everything I just talked about. They use it to hurt other people on purpose. Think Jim Jones, Hitler, Chris Watts more recently, who annihilated his whole family, in my opinion, was a malignant narcissist. There are communal narcissists. These are people that they seem to do good things in the community, but they never saw a camera they didn't love. There's an old saying that too much time in the spotlight fades the suit. These communal narcissists, they want to help the children, the animals, the forests, the trees, everything, but they want to do it in front of a camera. and They won't tell everybody they did it. They just want all the attention that comes from it. It's not altruistic. It's look at me, what a do-gooder I am. And they push that in people's face. And then there's the covert narcissist, and that's what we're talking about today. The covert narcissist, or sometimes what's called the vulnerable narcissist. Now, there are some subsets that people talk about a lot. Basically, I think there are four types of narcissism, the classic, malignant, communal, and covert. But people also talk about the hypervigilant, the overt, the sexual, the oblivious. There are different categories that are put on them, but I tend to stick with the big four, the classic, the malignant, the covert, and the communal. I want to talk about covert. I want to do a deep dive on this. Now, the covert narcissist, just to be straight up about it, these folks are much more subtle than the classic narcissist. They're not as brash. They're not as loud They're not as overt about what they want, but make no mistake, just like the classic narcissist, the covert narcissist wants the same things, and they have the same traits and characteristics. They do have grandiose thoughts. They do have a need for admiration. They are superficial. They do lack empathy. They have trouble forming attachments and bonds with other people. They have all the same traits and characteristics. They just express them more subtly. 
And so you have to be real careful to set up boundaries and protect yourself from these people, even though they're not quite as obvious. Just like the classic narcissist, they use the vicious tools of gaslighting. It's a hard thing to argue with a narcissist because they're going to gaslight you. You can talk to them and you're going to wind up thinking you're the one that's wrong because they're going to tell you, hey, it's not me, you're crazy. It's not me, it's you. I'm not mad. I'm just passionate. It's you being too sensitive. You're just insecure. You need help. I was just joking. Don't be so sensitive. That's just what you heard. That's not what I meant. By the time you get through getting gas lit by a narcissist, you're going to be doubting your own damn name. You don't want to argue with a narcissist because they are relentless and they will stay with it forever and a day before they ever cave in, and it's just not worth it. So setting boundaries with the narcissist in your life is very, very important. And I'm going to talk about five things you need to do to protect yourself in a little while. But let's do a deep dive on the covert narcissist. Covert narcissists have all the traits, characteristics, and symptoms, but they express them or display them in subtle ways. Now, this has really been talked about and discovered, you know, really pretty much in the current century, since the turn of the century. And there have been some experts that have really talked about this and done a lot of raising of awareness about this. Researchers like Campbell and Pincus, some of these researchers, have done a great job saying not all narcissists are the same. They don't all express it the same, and they've recognized this covert narcissism, and I think they've done a great service by identifying these people. Whereas the classic narcissist comes across as bold and brash and loud, and they're just out there beating the drum, these people tend to be more depressed. They come across as victimized. They're sullen and sad. I like to call them backdoor narcissists in my own mind. And they take on this victim role where they're downtrodden. Now, make no mistake, they still think they're the smartest person in the room, but what they're going to tell you is, hey, listen, I'm special, but nobody gets me. If they did... I would be a star. Like, hey, I went to Princeton. I got the big credentials, but nobody cares. Like, I'm overlooked. I'm a victim. They don't get out there and put it on the line. They'll tell you, I'm saving myself for management. I can't tell you how many times I've had parents on the show with mooching kids that are 30 years old living off a mama down in the basement sleeping until 2 or 3 in the afternoon, staying up playing video games till 4 in the morning, and I say, you're able-bodied. Why don't you get off your butt and get a job? Well, that's beneath me. I'm better than that. I'm not going to go to some training class at McDonald's and let them tell me how to make fries. I should be managing that McDonald's. I should be managing 10 franchises. I'm saving myself for management. They actually believe they're too good to get out there and work. They've convinced themselves of that. Their arrogance is so strong that they're just saying, I I have it all. I've just never been recognized. Now, they're outwardly self-effacing, and they do that in a way of what I call well, they have a whole bunch of techniques, but one of them I call is the humble brag. The humble brag is it's something they say that's ostensibly modest or it seems deprecating, but the actual intent is to draw attention to themselves and fish for compliments like, oh, I look terrible without any makeup on. 
they're expecting people to say, oh my God, are you kidding me? You don't have any makeup on? You look great. It's a humble brag. They think they look great. So there's false humility disguised as self-deprecating when they're really bragging on the fact that they want you to pay attention to how good they look without makeup. Guys do it all the time. I mean, they'll get out there and run around the track and do all this stuff. Say, oh, I haven't worked out in six months. I can't believe that I, I'm just, this is going to kill me. And then they get out there and run really fast or jump really high or whatever because they've been working out secretly and haven't told anybody about it. But these people are generally very self-absorbed and they're sullen. They think the world owes them a living. And they're inept at relationships. They're inept at intimacy. They spend a lot of time blaming and shaming. They play the but for game. But for the world having it in for me, I would be a huge success. But for you being lucky, I would have your job. But for you having a wealthy family, but for you having a powerful father, I would be doing better than you. They play the victim. And there's never any reciprocity with these people. It's always one way. They will suck you dry. In this world, there's a lot of ways you can divide people up. One way is there are givers and there are takers. These people are takers. Because remember, they have every characteristic of the classic narcissist. They have no empathy. They don't care what you think. They don't care what you feel. They don't care what you need. They will take what they can get from you. And if you fall down and break your leg, they will step right over you if it serves their purpose. They have a very fragile sense of self. They never give any compliments because that would be at their expense. If they gave you a serious compliment, a sincere compliment, if they said, hey, you really did a fine job today, that speech you gave was really genuine, it was authentic, and it inspired the whole group. They could never give you that compliment because they would see that as at their expense. Covert narcissist parents, for example, we'll talk more about this later, but covert narcissist parents oftentimes cannot be happy for their children's successes because they compare themselves to their own children. I have said before that my father died when I was in my 40s. Now, I wasn't a perfect kid. I certainly wasn't a perfect young adult. I certainly wasn't a perfect adult. But I think in the general scheme of things, I did okay. That's not a humble brag. I'm saying that in the grand scheme of things, I think I did okay. I never got any felony arrest. I didn't do drugs or alcohol. I completed college. I went on a scholarship to school, to a Division I school. I got married. I was a responsible father. I got a PhD. I graduated number one in my class. I was very successful. I was good to my mother. I mean, I think I was a pretty good citizen. And I achieved some, I think, reasonably lofty goals. Not one time in the 43 or 4 years that I was alive did he ever say, I'm proud of you. Now, why not? Because I think he was a covert narcissist. He needed admiration. And anything that took attention away from him and came on to me was at his expense. He couldn't do it. He couldn't give me a compliment. He couldn't tell me he was proud of me. He couldn't acknowledge me because he felt like that was at his expense and he couldn't afford to do it. Now, that's what I mean when I say these people have a fragile sense of self. They can't give compliments. Now, they won't confront you about it they will be passive-aggressive about it. 
but it's just as damaging. See, an aggressive person will tell you, hey, I think you're an idiot. I think you got blind ass lucky and fell into this job and you don't deserve it. A covert narcissist will not do that. They will not get in your face and tell you what they think. What they will do is snipe at you indirectly and or behind your back. They will say things like, oh, must be nice. What, 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 what must be nice? Well, must be nice to grow up with a family where they set everything up for you. I mean, must be nice that your dad knows the boss. Must be nice to fall into this job. I guess your dad was a legacy at Harvard, so that made it easy to get it. I mean, must be nice. I mean, it's not like he's saying it's unfair. He's just saying it must be nice. He's raging inside because he thinks the world owes him a living to the point that he's actually paranoid about it. You know, she may actually think the world is out to get her, but rather than say that, it's just like, yeah, you know, lucky you. You know, must be nice. So they do what I call leveling. See, people that are insecure are always either pursuing or retreating in a relationship. They're never on level ground, just experiencing it. So when I say leveling, they always see themselves in competition with you. So they've either got to shoot you down by sabotaging you, criticizing you, undermining you, or they've got to fluff themselves up so they perceive themselves as being lifted up to your level. But they're always leveling themselves with you. Now, I'm saying these things to you because I want you to listen for them because if you're living with a covert narcissist and you don't realize it, there's just something not right and it's wearing you out. I want you to recognize what it is. Is there somebody in your life that's saying a lot of these things, doing a lot of these things? Is there somebody that is sullen and complaining and whining all the time and they just don't ever get involved? They don't ever get engaged they just always sit back and criticize others. They think they have unseen gifts. They think they are the smartest person in the room, but yet they won't take a risk. And they mock the people who do. Those that are out there doing, they sit in the cheap seats and snark at them, snipe at them, criticize what they're doing. These are paranoid malcontents that complain about everything playing the victim. Now, you've probably heard this quote a hundred times, but it's really fitting here. Theodore Roosevelt said it on April 23rd, 1910. This is a quote. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasm, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. 
Now, let's take that apart for a minute. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or the doer of deed could have done them better. It's not him that counts. The credit belongs to the man in the arena, the one that gets off his butt, gets off the bench, gets out of his chair, and gets in the arena and gets his hands dirty. He said, the credit goes to the man whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly. He errs. There's no effort without error and shortcoming. He knows great enthusiasms, great devotions, and he spends himself at a worthy cause. Maybe he wins and maybe he loses, but by God, he got out there and did it. And that is the last place you will ever find the covert narcissist. And if you ever say to them, why don't you get out there and show us all these gifts you have? You say you're the smartest person in the room. You say you know better than the boss. You say you have all the answers. Why don't you get out there and show us? You know what their response will be? They will rage at you like you would not believe because they're paranoid. You're disrespecting them. You must be out to get them. How dare you call them into question? These are the people that sit at home and wait. They're not going to get out there as an entrepreneur. They're not going to get out there and create a business. They're not going to open a bicycle shop or start a restaurant or start a delivery service or open a practice in medicine or physical therapy or whatever it is that they want to do. No, no, they're going to sit at home and complain that it wasn't delivered to them on a silver platter because the world's out to get them. And the one who does, they're going to say, well, yeah, it must be nice. Somebody clearly gave them a paved road. Yeah, must be nice. His daddy must be rich. Her daddy must have known somebody. They are hypersensitive to criticism. So you're going to get all of these must be nice statements. They don't have the guts to step up and say, I don't think you deserve it. They can say, hey, yeah, must be nice. Good for you. Wish I had a free ride. Wish I was lucky. They're going to seem self-effacing. But they're not. You know, they're going to sit back and say, hey, I just work here. What they really mean is I'm getting jerked around by management, by you, by everybody, because they are entitled. They are closet the best. They think they are the smartest person in the room, just waiting for the universe to deliver them their just rewards. And of course, that never happens, and they are envious of everybody that is succeeding. They're not happy for anybody. They're not happy for a damn person. Even things that they may have achieved. They'll say, ah, nobody cares. Why do they say that? Because they got to be the victim. They got to feel sorry for themselves. This is a pity party. So that's where you get all of this. Yeah, some people have all the luck. Now, I'll tell you something that gives these people away. They are incredibly judgmental. The covert narcissist, as I have just pointed out, they're going to judge everybody in the arena, they're the critic. They're the ones that point out how the doer of deeds, how the strong man stumbles. They are the ones that are going to point out how that was stupid. Can you believe that? Can you believe he did that? Can you believe she said that? Oh, come on. They're going to snipe and snark at everybody that's out there doing anything. They're going to sit back and criticize. Sarcasm, 
put downs every step of the way. One of the things that's going to give them away, and you'll see this when you spend any time with them, they are incredibly argumentative, and they will argue about abstract issues like policies at work, politics. They are self-righteous and sanctimonious, and they will criticize people for having an opinion. And they will say, can you believe that that guy would say that about this? Can you believe that? They'll even say to you, how could you say that? How could you say that about these people? That is so mean. That is so vicious. Completely ignoring the fact that they're tearing you a new ass. I mean, they do the very thing they're criticizing you for, but they want to ignore that. They are entitled. They think they are owed more, and they have this toxic energy that they bring into everything. You know, it's like when toxic people stop backstabbing you and sabotaging you and talking about you. It's like the trash took itself out. It's like all of a sudden a hush falls over your life. There's nobody stabbing you in the back. It's like it just went away. These are the people you work with that you think, wish these people would get transferred or transfer me. Just get me away from this. This person is sullen and bitter and paranoid and negative. It doesn't matter. We could get a Christmas bonus and they could double it. And they would say, oh, yeah, wonder what they got. It doesn't matter. The covert narcissist, you can never do enough for them. They are sullen, arrogant, dissatisfied, and there is a rage deceiving under the surface. And if you're in a relationship with one of them, they're going to suck you dry. They're going to suck every bit of life energy out of you a little at a time, and you're not going to see it coming because you think you're going to fix them. You think you're going to rescue them, and trust me, you're not. For two reasons, they don't want to be rescued. They don't want to be rescued. They want to wallow in their self-pity. They want to wallow in their victimhood. They're like the guy in the lake and he's drowning and a boat comes by and throw him a rope. He says, no, 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 God's going to save me. So they go on. Pretty soon another boat comes by and throws a rope. No, no, don't need your rope. God's going to save me. Then he drowns and finally sees the Lord. says, how could you let me drown? What do you mean? I sent you two boats and two ropes. You just wouldn't grab on. I mean, that's their attitude. Nothing is ever good enough. Was well, this heaven supposed to open and he was supposed to be part the Red Sea and lift him out? Nothing is ever good enough. I swear they would complain to God himself. So for you to think you're going to rescue them, that is not going to happen. These people are asocial. They don't want to be around anybody else. And I'm going to tell you why. Other people take the attention away from them. They don't want to go to your family's house for Thanksgiving. They don't want to go to their house for Thanksgiving because they might not be the center of attention. And if you say, well, okay, go for me. I miss my sisters. I miss my brother. I miss my parents. So go for me. If God forbid they go, they're going to sit there and make smart aleck remarks and put downs and make everybody miserable the whole time. Pray to God they don't go because you're going to be sorry if they do. And when you say you want to go, you want to see your family, they're going to gaslight you. <laughs> I told you they're going to gaslight you. And what does gaslighting do? It makes you doubt yourself. So what are they going to say? They go, oh, 
I get it. You need that attention. These are the people that thought you were special all your life, and you need that. Now, you need to go back there so they can pamper you. And you need that in order to feel good about who you are. So you need to go to Thanksgiving so everybody can make over you. And hey, listen, if you need that, I'll go. I mean, I love you. I would think I would be enough for you. But if not, hey, listen, I, I load up. Hell, let's go. That's the gaslighting. They're making you feel like there's something wrong with you for wanting to have a healthy attachment to your family or people in your life who you're connected with. Now, you know, when we first started talking about covert narcissists versus the brash and bold narcissists, you thought, well, maybe these are kind of baby narcissists. Maybe these are those that they're not quite so bad. But what you're seeing now is that they're just as entitled, they're just as arrogant, they're just as sucky, They're just as demanding and demeaning as the classic narcissist. I think in many ways they're worse. At least those other ones are easy to spot. These masquerade as depressed, sad, wounded, damaged. And who do they pair up with? They tend to connect with empathetic people. They find people that have caring hearts, giving hearts. They find people that care about somebody besides themselves. And so you go and say, hey, this person seems really depressed. They seem really sad. Maybe I can help them out. And they may have some good qualities about them. I'm not saying they're bad human beings, but they will appeal to your empathetic soul And then once they get their hooks in you, yeah, they're going to make you pay. They're going to make you pay. And they're going to be real hard to pin down about it. Their goal, because as I said, this is all about leveling, is to keep you one down. Keep you one down make you feel small so they can feel big. And here are some questions to ask yourself if you're being manipulated, if you're being gaslighted. When you're around the person that you think might be a covert narcissist, do you kind of tend to get the feeling that you just can't do anything right? Do you tend to feel trapped in your relationship, isolated from other people, where you have to devote your attention to this person and you're guilt-induced if you need or want anybody else? Are you lonely? Even though you're in a relationship, are you left feeling lonely? Are you riddled with doubt and worry that you can't measure up, you're smart, you're not smart enough, and you're too delicate? Now, you would feel that because any time you complained, a covert narcissist would be telling you, hey, look, you're just too thin-skinned. There's nothing wrong with me. You're just too thin-skinned. But you need to grow up. You need to grow a pair. You need to toughen up. So, are you riddled with doubt, worry that you're not smart enough, that you can't measure up to their expectations? You're just too thin-skinned. Is your predominant feeling in this relationship guilt and shame? Do you spend an inordinate amount of time listening to this person tell you how great yet undiscovered they are. They don't get up on a soapbox and beat their chest. They tell you how great but undiscovered they are. If they only knew, I could fix this whole thing. I've got the answers. They just don't care. They don't want me to fix this. 
Do they lie to you and then tell you they didn't? Do they demand rather than command respect? Now, this is a big distinction. There are those who demand respect because you just owe it to them versus earn it. So they command it with their integrity, with their conduct, with their behavior. Big difference between someone who commands respect versus someone who demands it. Anybody can demand it. Not everybody can command it. And I guess the acid test is this final question. Do you feel worse about yourself when you're around this person than you did before you were around them? Because if you have a healthy relationship with someone that you love and they love you, you should feel better about yourself having been around them than you did before you were around them. And that's a matter of degree, but to a great extent, those that have a real health-engendering personality, you interact with them and feel better about who you are after you do it. Oprah is that way. Oprah has what I call a health-engendering personality. You just talk to her for 10 minutes, you feel better about you than you did before you talked to her. Now, you also feel better about her. <laughs> you can't help it because she is a diamond. But you're going to feel better about you after talking to her. These people are selfish. They don't want to talk about you. They don't want to make you feel better. They do not have any regard for your time. They will stand you up. They will be late. They will never make a commitment. They will leave you hanging. And they will never, ever, never do anything for you to which there are not strings attached. There's never a gift. There is never a favor. It is always an obligation. There are certain people that are covert narcissists that the last thing in the world you ever want from them is a gift. Because, oh my God, are you going to pay for that? It's like, oh, please don't give me that. No, thank you. No, thank you. Don't want it. Don't need it. Can't use it. Because I'm going to pay for it the rest of my life. You buy me a new car? No, thank you. I'd rather walk. You don't want it because the price is too high. Now, why is this? Well, it comes back to the first thing that we talked about. These people have superficial relationships. They don't care about you one whit. Everything is about them. They are takers. They approach everything by saying, what is in this for me? And trust me, if they give you something, it's leverage. It is not a gift. There are strings tied to it. There are steel cables tied to it. It is just bait. They're trying to hook you so they own you. Let's do a quick summary. Some signs that you're in a relationship with a covert narcissist. They're highly sensitive to criticism. They're passive-aggressive in their behavior. They're always sabotaging you, mocking you, giving you the silent treatment, guilt-inducing you. They seem to put themselves down, but not really. It's like, well, I, you know, I, I just I don't have all the answers here, but you know, they wouldn't listen anyway. Kind of like I do, it's just they won't listen. They're shy meaning they don't get into the arena, like Theodore Roosevelt said. They, they're the critic who sits on the side. They have grandiose fantasies about being the smartest person in the world, but they do have depression and anxiety. They tend to hold grudges. They envy people who do well rather than them. They live in this fog of inadequacy, and they fake empathy. They don't really care about anybody 
But if they've seen it on TV or maybe they went to therapy for a little while, they'll mimic it. So if you're checking all of these things off, the questions I asked you before, and then these items, if you're getting some yeses on this, you may well be in a relationship with a covert narcissist. You may ask yourself, why did I get involved? Well, I guarantee you, you do an autopsy on this, it's because you wanted to help, you wanted to rescue. But you feel powerful if you help somebody. You feel good. That's one of the things that's made the human race proliferate is we care about each other. We want to help each other. But make no mistake, whatever you do to help is going to be wrong, and they're going to have contempt towards you, and you will never be able to do enough. Even if you're the child. The child can win awards. They go, yeah, well... If I'd have had your upbringing, I'd have won awards too. Well, maybe you fooled them, but I know who you really are. And look, the thing is, a lot of these people did have a tough ride. But the question is not, did they have a tough ride as a child? The question is, what are they doing about it as an adult? Having a tough childhood is not an excuse for being an abuser as an adult, it just means you have a steeper hill to climb. And living with depression, anxiety, creating work problems, that, that's no way to go through life. Even if you treat those things in a covert narcissist, you can treat their depression, you can treat their anxiety, you can treat a phobia, you can treat their addiction. And you think, okay, yeah, that's good, fix them up. Well, when you're through, you still have a covert narcissist. You just alleviated some symptoms. They still are entitled. They still think the world owes them a living. They're still going to be critical of everybody. They're just not going to be as depressed when they do it. So how do you protect yourself from these people? Well, you can't take it personal. And you say, well, that's easy for you to say, Dr. Phil. You're not living with one. Well, I did. I did live with one. And you just have to say, look, how people treat me is more about them than it is about me. You can't take it personal. If your mother is a bitter woman who puts you down, that's about her. It's not about you. That's not a maternal thing to do. She's sick you're not. You need to strengthen your relationship with yourself. Be your own best friend. Your own best friend. If you had a best friend that was in this situation, you would tell them, don't listen to her. Don't listen to him. Believe in yourself. Don't give your power away to this person. Set boundaries. You need to advocate for you. And if you have to, create a healthy distance. Give yourself permission to not feel badly. And don't expect two things. Don't expect that you're going to fix this person and do not expect an apology. Because you're not going to fix them and they're not going to apologize. Now, you're probably thinking, well, man, you're being pretty pessimistic here, Dr. Phil. Look, I'm just telling you how it is. Now, if you want to spend two years trying to fix some narcissist, go ahead. And in two years, you'll say, well, okay, well, he was right. I wasn't going to do it. I, I couldn't do it. We've been talking about the covert narcissist here. Remember, I said there's the classic narcissist. These are the chest thumpers. They get up there in the front of them. The covert narcissist has all the same feelings of entitlement specialness, they just kind of sit back quietly and sabotage everybody else, feel sorry for themselves, and covertly live like they're the smartest person in the room. So what's left? We're going to talk some more about this because we're going to talk about how to handle a covert narcissist at work, how to 
get over being raised by a covert parent. There's also the communal narcissist and the malignant narcissist. We're going to talk about some of those things as well. Now, when you go to the website, fill in the blanks website, you're going to find some of those questions that I asked you before kind of in a checklist. So you can kind of go through and say, hey, I got a lot of yeses here, so I must be <laughs> a, certainly a candidate for living with a covert narcissist. So those yeses become to-do list items for me because I need to do what Dr. Phil is saying. I need to put up boundaries. I need to keep my power and not let this person control me. You need to stop explaining yourself. You need to stop making yourself vulnerable to this person. You need to stop looking for attunement. Attunement is sensing another's emotional state and responding accordingly. You don't want to do that with a covert narcissist, because their emotional state is victim, paranoia, and put down. You don't want to be attuned with that. Stop expecting them to change and stop making excuses for them. Your family's going to think you've lost your mind because they don't have the foggy glasses on that you do, and they know who you're living with, him or her, is narcissistic. Stop making excuses for this person. It is what it is. All right, we're going to talk about this some more. Now, look, why am I doing this series? I'm doing this series because you guys have asked for it. And it is a series. We're going to talk about narcissism. Then we're going to move on to borderline personality. We're going to talk about some of those things that when you have the power and insight to understand and manage these people, then I've always said... If you know why people do what they do and don't do what they don't do, you have an incredible edge in life. You have to understand human nature. Know why people do the things they do. Know why they don't do the things they don't do. When you understand that, you know what levers to pull, what buttons to push. You have power in this life. And I want you to know that. And I'm starting with narcissists because they sure seem to be frequenting our population right now. So we've talked about classic. We've talked about covert. They all want the same thing. They just go at it differently. And we're going to talk about how to manage them in the workplace, at home, in the neighborhood. We're going to touch on all of those things very, very soon. And then we're going to move on to borderline personality. So I appreciate you spending this time with me talking about this. I don't always talk about it in traditional ways, but trust me, I do my homework, and everything I'm telling you, you will find grounded in the research about these people. I've got almost 50 years' experience studying them, but I still do my research. I still go to the journals. I still read the current research on these people to find out what the trends are, what's working with them, what's not working with them. And we'll be talking about some of that in the future. But I can tell you the prognosis is just not good. They don't tend to respond to therapy very well. Which means the focus needs to be on you and protecting you. I'm Dr. Phil. Thanks for spending this time with me.